The Airbnb listing seemed perfect. A quaint, secluded cabin nestled in the heart of the woods. The photos boasted rustic charm, with a cozy fireplace and panoramic views of the surrounding forest. I was looking forward to a weekend escape from the city's chaos, but what I found instead was something far darker. It all began when I arrived. The cabin was just as charming as advertised, though the sense of isolation was more palpable than I had anticipated. It was the kind of quiet that makes you think the world outside has ceased to exist. The owner, a wiry man with a nervous twitch, handed over the keys and mumbled something about the forest being full of surprises. His words seemed more cryptic than cautionary, but I shrugged it off. The first night was uneventful. I enjoyed a quiet dinner, read by the fire, and went to bed early, relishing the peace. It wasn't until the second night that things took a turn. Around midnight, I was jolted awake by a scratching sound coming from the living room. It was sharp and rhythmic, like claws scraping against wood. I tried to convince myself it was just a raccoon or some other woodland creature, but the sound was persistent, growing louder. I decided to investigate. I crept into the living room, clutching a flashlight. The cabin was dark, save for the eerie glow of the moonlight streaming through the windows. The scratching had stopped, but I noticed something odd. The furniture had been rearranged slightly, as if someone or something had been moving things around. A cold chill ran down my spine. I scanned the room with the flashlight, but there was no sign of any intruder. I went back to bed, but sleep wouldn't come easily. The unease gnawed at me, a feeling that something was terribly wrong. The next morning, I noticed that a few of my personal items had been disturbed. My laptop was on the coffee table instead of the desk and my backpack was unzipped. I reassured myself that maybe I had been sleepwalking or that I was simply too tired to remember where I had put things. Still, the cabin felt increasingly unsettling. That night, the scratching returned. It was louder this time, accompanied by a low, guttural growl. My heart pounded as I tiptoed through the dark house. The source of the noise seemed to come from the basement. I had planned to avoid the basement entirely, as it looked old and decrepit from the outside. But curiosity and fear drove me down the creaky stairs. The basement was dimly lit by a single flickering bulb. The smell was musty, with an undertone of something rotten. I shined my flashlight around, revealing old furniture covered in white sheets and boxes piled haphazardly. The scratching noise was now accompanied by soft, guttural murmurs that seemed almost like whispers. I was about to turn back when I saw it a shadow moving against the wall, shifting and writhing. The shape seemed to stretch and twist, like a distorted reflection in a funhouse mirror. It was then that I realized, the shadow wasn't just a shadow. It was something alive, something that could change its form at will. Before I could react, the shadow coalesced into a solid figure. It was a tall, gaunt man with hollow eyes and a mouth that twisted into an unsettling grin. The figure seemed to breathe, the shadows around it flickering as if animated by its presence. Who are you? I demanded, my voice trembling. The figure's grin widened. I'm whatever you need me to be, it rasped, its voice echoing as if coming from multiple sources. I stumbled backward, my flashlight flickering out as I fumbled to turn it back on. The figure advanced, shifting between human and monstrous forms, its eyes glowing with malevolent intent. I bolted up the stairs, the shadow chasing me, growing closer with each step. I burst into the kitchen and grabbed a knife from the drawer, though I knew it would be useless against such an entity. The creature followed me into the room, its form shifting rapidly, taking on nightmarish shapes. Desperation fueled my actions as I scrambled to barricade the door with furniture. The creature's laughter filled the cabin, a horrid sound that seemed to seep into my bones. I could hear it moving around, testing the barricades. I was trapped, every creak of the house echoing like a taunt. As dawn approached, the creature's attacks grew less frequent. It seemed to lose interest as the first light of day crept through the windows. Exhausted and terrified, I managed to find my phone and called the police. When they arrived, the creature had vanished, leaving no trace of its presence.
The police found no evidence of an intruder, only the mess I had left behind. They suggested I might have been hallucinating due to stress. I couldn't convince them otherwise, and the experience left me shaken and haunted. I left the cabin that morning, vowing never to return. The Airbnb host seemed oddly calm when I told him about the events, as if he already knew. I never received a refund or any apology. To this day, I can't shake the feeling that the shapeshifter is still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next prey. And I've learned the hard way that some places are better left unexplored. Reed and I were together for five years, but sometimes I lost track. As they say, time flies when you're having fun. He was everything I've ever wanted in a man. Reed was handsome, patient, attentive, and passionate. Recently, I had the pleasure of stringing nearly 100 iterations of the word, yes, together, clutching my mouth, tears of joy running over my fingers. I never thought I could love as much as I love Reed. I've always dreamed of walking down an aisle of budding lilacs on a warm spring day. The wooden white chairs lined the aisle with all my friends on either side, and my mother looking on with her shimmering, beautiful smile. Beyond the purple garden would be the calming rolling ocean, beating against a bright white sand beach. But as you know, love alone doesn't finance the wedding I've fantasized about since I was a little girl. We're both still drowning in student debt, and I haven't exactly found the salary I expected when I graduated. But once you find your true love, you have all the time in the world. Nonetheless, Reed and I decided we should take a celebratory engagement vacation. He was under a lot of pressure after his new promotion to senior manager, and my company had just wrapped up year-end closings. So after a few weeks of my persuasive yet probably incessant pleading, he agreed to take a late summer trip down to Georgia. I wanted to find a cozy historic Airbnb. I'd always wanted to stay in a historic home for a few nights, but probably never buy one because of the mind-numbing maintenance restrictions on updates to it and all other possible issues with owning one. But of course, given our financial situation that was well off the table anyway, our shared love of history made this an easier sell than most vacations for my stubborn fiancé. We arrived starry-eyed and wildly in love in Savannah, Georgia as young couples are. I'll preface this by saying I've never fell out of love with him, and I never will despite all that happened. We picked Savannah because of its rich history and colonial feel. For a week we could pretend we lived in simpler times, or at least feel a touch of what it was like in the 19th century. The Airbnb we settled on was just off the main drag, right at the heart of the city. It was built in 1819 by a wealthy couple. The husband, Hugh John, built the home for his wife, Mora. He made sure it was constructed to her exact specifications, down to every detail. How romantic, I said to Reed, swooning over an early 1800s love story. Don't get any ideas, Reed jested. We'd be lucky to own a one-bedroom by the time we're 70 at this rate. Did you see that old lady out front? What old lady? I asked. She looked at me like I had six heads when I unlocked the door to the house. Absolutely disgusted. What did I do? I laughed. Reed, I wouldn't overthink it too much. That was one of the things he did best. I guess it was a side effect of his deep emotional connections with people. Maybe she thought you smelled bad. He heaved out a forced laugh and shook his head. She was clearly still occupying his busy mind. I'll just bring everything upstairs. You get settled down here and figure out if this place has Wi-Fi. For some reason I doubt it, Reed. But I'll look around. I smiled at him over my shoulder and waved goodbye as if he was leaving for work. He grabbed both our suitcases, clenched his teeth, breathed out sharply, and started up the stairs. The old wooden boards creaked beneath his heels. I secretly hoped I wouldn't find a Wi-Fi password. I just wanted us to enjoy our time together and disconnect from the world. My eyes tracked him up the winding stairs until he was out of sight. When he was gone, I did as he suggested and searched around the main floor for an owner's manual. We had only ever been in two rentals before, 
but both had some kind of guide lying around. In Nashville, a few sticky notes were pasted to the cabinet with the most beautiful handwriting I'd ever seen. The other was a glamping cabin in Pennsylvania where the family left a laminated binder to recommend all three restaurants within 30 minutes along with detailed instructions on all their smart home technologies. I walked through the living room and found very little that resembled a welcome kit. Most of what I found was vintage furniture and candle wax stains on the floor. It was strange such wealthy owners didn't take the time to repair such obvious stains, but perhaps it reminded them of the house's age, the stories it had to tell of which I admittedly knew none. I ran my fingers along the walnut end table beside the couch, my fingers collecting a dusty clump along the way. I wiped it off on the couch's arm. The house appeared even older than it was. The last thing I forgot to mention about this place was that it burned down in 1831. It was rebuilt in the exact image of the original structure, but it took three years for reconstruction, so the house wasn't quite as old as advertised. I spun around the room before moving on to the kitchen. The ornate window above the front door was near the only light the house had while the ceiling lights were still off. The sunlight illuminated dust hanging in the air so still. I approached the fireplace enamored by its dacre. Two dark wooden ionic columns stood at either side of the firebox. The iron bar doors twisted together in front of the charred wood. As I drew closer I noticed the dust hanging in the air still hadn't moved hadn't parted when I walked through it. I slowly raised a hand to test it, to see if it had shift when I swiped at it. Suddenly I jumped and gasped. My body jolted involuntarily. I let out a weak shriek I momentarily wished was louder. I spun around, wide-eyed and ready to strike at. Hey, sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, Reed said with an unwelcome smile. Did you find the Wi-Fi? He asked eagerly. I just finished setting us up upstairs. No, I admitted with a sigh. I've been, I don't know. Does the air feel heavy to you? Heavy? Reed snorted. What do you mean, Lori? I turned all about to re-examine the dust, I couldn't see it anymore. I shook my head. Nothing, forget it. Let's go find the welcome kit if there is even is one. Reed could tell I was upset, I saw the way his eyes scanned me. But he didn't ask. We looked through the kitchen and eventually found a dirtied post-it note that read P at S5 word. Reed logged into it and immediately dipped his head into his phone. I watched as his mesmerizing brown eyes glazed over against the blue glow. It ebbed and flashed as his fingers whipped over the screen. I reached out and gently covered the screen, drawing him closer with my other hand. Hey, Reed honey, he looked up, his eyes regaining focus. Can we lay off the phones just for the weekend? Well, I just have to check a few emails from work and make sure the team doesn't need me. We have to get a deliverable out by Monday and... He started to protest. I cocked my head and grimaced. Okay, fine, you're right. Let's just enjoy this week together. He slid his phone into his pocket and looked into my eyes the way he did when we first met. What do you say we tour around a bit? My grimace turned to an unavoidable smile. I nodded and took his hand. Reed always did know how to make me smile. Let's go upstairs. The rooms are amazing. And so we did. I followed closely behind him up the winding staircase. I looked up at him, only seeing the back of his wrinkled gray t-shirt and backwards red socks hat. The two socks hung from the tee in Boston, and the brim was worn from constant use. Come to think of it, Reed would wear that hat more often than he'd ever wear real socks. I tried to curl my steps inwards to see if I could walk without causing the floorboards to creak. But after more than a few tries I realized it was fruitless. Upstairs the air felt less dense, but maybe that was because Reed was with me. The rooms were as amazing as he suggested. The master bedroom was fitted with a large Persian red and black carpet with a twisting pattern mostly covering the oak wooden floor. The far end of the carpet disappeared underneath the low feet of the king-sized half-tester bed frame. Sunlight peeked through the dark green drapes before Reed yanked them open to reveal the grassy square beneath. It's beautiful, I commented. 
This was really a great find. You know me, he said. Travel planner extraordinaire. It's an art, really. I laughed, and he broke a smile. Reed wrapped his arm around me. We stood at the window and watched the busy streets below a woman walking her dog, a man waiting impatiently to cross a street, a couple moseying aimlessly beneath the Spanish moss tree. Then I heard a creaking coming from behind us. I shuddered and tucked myself closer to Reed's side. Did you hear that? It was probably just a draft, Reed soothingly replied. Come on, let's go check it out. I reluctantly followed him away from the bedroom window towards the hall. Reed rounded the corner outside the door frame and briefly zipped out of sight. And in that brief moment, something slammed shut. I stopped dead in my tracks. I tried to concentrate on my breath, control it, but it only got heavier. My skin grew clammy and most likely pale, my eyes lost focus. I attempted to utter his name, but only a whimper came out. Attempting to gather myself, I tried again. Reed, I called out. What's up, Lori? His hatted head poked out from the doorframe. I sighed, relieved, and wiped my brow with my sleeve. Nothing, I replied. What is it? You've seemed on edge since we got here. I nodded, confirming his observations. I just it's just I've read so much about this city and how haunted it is. I guess it all really got to my head. I'm probably just being paranoid. Reed laid a hand on my shoulder and guided me out of the bedroom. So you did psych yourself out even when I told you not to. You know how you get with ghost stories. You're right. But you know there's just been so much death here, two bouts of yellow fever, fires, unsolved murders, you can't help but think. He gave me a stern look. No, you're right. There are no ghosts, he said. You'll be fine. In a way I guess his statement still holds true. I would be fine. We reached the living room once more, and from a long day of travel and scaring myself with ghost stories on the internet, I flopped onto the couch in exhaustion. Reed still had much more energy than me and started looking for the TV remote. I'd have to concede the battle over the TV in my vendetta against electronics on vacation. I caressed the velvety carpet with my bare toes while I watched him search. Reed stuck his hand behind the television and scurried his fingers over the mantle on which it sat. His expression suddenly shifted and he triumphantly presented the television remote and declared, found it. Reed made his way to the couch without looking and instead examining the buttons on the remote the full way over. As Reed shuffled over to the couch his sneaker caught on a divot in the carpet. Whoa, he yelled shakily. While the remote occupied one hand, his other arm flailed for balance. He fell flat on his stomach with an echoing thud. I started laughing. I couldn't help myself. It's not funny, he winced. I tried to stop, but it was no use. My sides buckled and my eyes would hardly stay open, tearing up at the corners. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I continued laughing anyway. Eventually, I was able to hold my breath long enough that my laughing subsided. I looked back over to him. Here, let me help you up. Reed shushed me. Hold on a minute. He closed his fist and lightly hit the carpet. Do you hear that? Hear what? I asked, though I already knew what he meant. I heard it too. It sounds hollow. Reed tossed the remote to the side, suddenly disinterested with the television. At the moment, I preferred he dove into his phone's screen again. He grabbed the carpet's lining and lifted the corner. His eyes squinted, his face overtaken by wonder. He pulled it back further. What is it, Reed? I asked. I stood to get a better look. He didn't answer, but continued pulling. He stood from where he fell and pulled up two-thirds of the carpet, then threw it over the couch. His eyes lit up like a five-year-old boy who'd just seen a train for the first time. What is it? It's it's, he stammered. It's a door. I approached his side to lay eyes on his discovery. That is so cool. His tone changed drastically. Reed knelt down and blew on the wooden floor. Dust drifted aside and sure enough, there it was. 
a distinctive rectangular outline splitting the floorboard's natural pattern. A couple screws secured one side of the shape, while the other was fastened with a circular faded silver handle lying flat nestled into a slot in the wood. Of course, Reed's arm shot towards the handle. He stared at me deviously. Reed, no. Don't open it. You don't know what's down there. Maybe it's where they store all the dead bodies, he jeered. Or maybe the owner puts all their personal stuff they don't want you touching down there. Leave it alone, I pleaded. I frowned forcefully, putting on my best guilt-inducing expression. It was too late. Reed was too entrenched in the idea. Come on, Lori. I'm not going to steal anything. I just want to have a look. Can't you be respectful of their place? I want to be invited back. It's beautiful here. Even as I spoke, the handle was already firmly in his grasp. Where's your sense of adventure? I'm just going to have a peek. Five minutes tops. I sighed. Fine. I didn't mean it. I still wished he would just relent. Instead, Reed's smile widened. He put all his weight behind the handle and stood, pulling it from its frame. Once the door was above his shoulders, he finished the job by pushing from underneath. It creaked against its rusted old hinges until the door smacked into the floor beside it. Reed, I scolded. Be careful, you're going to scratch the floor. Sorry, he said with clenched teeth, knowing as well as I did it would leave a mark. The open floor revealed a wooden ladder. My guess is it hadn't been used in over 100 years. A step was broken in half, and it swayed against the drafty air, dipping into the pitch-black nothingness beneath. I'd never seen such pure darkness. I had an unnerving hunch. Something sinister crept beneath. I tried to shake the feeling, writing it off as another incarnation of my internet ghost stories. Reed stuck a foot on the ladder's first rung to test it. He put more and more of his body weight on it until he was confident it could hold him. Appearing satisfied, he turned around to dip his torso into the hole, grabbing onto the ladder. Reed, I pleaded once more. He looked up at me with his gleaming brown eyes. Five minutes tops. I stepped back, oddly worried the hole would suck me in. I watched the top of his Red Sox baseball cap fade into the darkness below. His feet slapped against the wet ground beneath. An artificial light flicked on and beamed around him. He'd taken his phone out of his pocket for a flashlight. Reed looked back up at me, the baseball cap pushing into his shoulder blades. Just so I can see. Then I'll put it away, promise. I nodded, not sure if he could detect such subtlety in my movements from ten feet down. He either saw my nod or didn't need my approval, most likely the latter. Reed pointed his phone forwards and slid deeper into the darkness. Despite his phone illuminating his surroundings, I saw no sign of the floor he stood on, or even what surrounded him. The light ceased only about six inches around him in any direction, and then silence. I couldn't tell how far he had ventured, and soon the time he spent down there grew hazy. My tapping foot and sweating brow all but annihilated any natural sense of time I might have had. Where was he? How big could the cellar or whatever was down there actually be? Why didn't I hear even a peep? It was so unlike him. My mind swirled. I began to fear the worst. Reed, I called down, sticking my face into the foreboding hole. He didn't answer. Reed, I repeated. Then I heard someone running, but the steps were too light to be his. Pattering against the damp ground, splashing through each puddle. Something resembling pots and pans fell. I shuddered giggling echoed from the hole the giggle of a little girl. Reed, I called out meekly. Who was down there with him? The laugh echoed slightly louder. As scared as I was, I needed to go down looking for him. He was my fiancé, and it was time to bail him out of another one of his adventures. I grabbed my phone, turned my back towards the hole, and descended the ladder. I coughed against the musty air beneath. I took each step cautiously, each rung more obscured than the last in the thick black hole. Finally, I felt the ground, soaking against my bare feet. Ugh, I muttered to myself. I groped my pockets, trying to get a decent hold on my phone. 
I wrapped my fingers tightly around it to be sure not to drop it in whatever I was standing in. The screen lit up with an old selfie of Reed and I in front of the Washington Monument on a crisp spring day. I pressed the button on the bottom left of the lock screen, activating the flashlight. Just as it had been for Reed, I saw nothing beyond six inches in front of my face. The light was swallowed by whatever lie ahead. Reed, I called out louder, still no answer. Then I jumped and yelped. My heart pounded faster. The giggle echoed once more, even louder this time, all around me. I couldn't tell what direction it came from, and I was positive it wasn't Reed. Reed, who's down here? Where are you? Still nothing. I started to get angry with him. Reed, answer me. Where are you? This isn't funny. No reply. I inched forwards, extending my phone out in front of me to provide better lighting it was useless. Reed, where are you? Something moderately hard hit my knee, then splashed into a puddle beside my foot. Oh, I yelled, but it startled me much more than it hurt. It had the texture of cloth, but heavily reinforced. I guided the phone's light down to get a better look at what it was. I gasped and tripped over my own heels. I couldn't get away from the sight fast enough. In a murky puddle beside my feet, about six inches deep was, his hat. That red sox hat floated and spun slowly in the puddle, until it turned around revealing more of a dark red than I was so accustomed to splotches of blood seeped down over the badge and saturated the brim. I covered my shaking lips with my free hand and began to cry. Reed, please answer me. Where are you? I managed to utter through a shaking voice. Then the running started again. The pitter-patter of small feet darting over the wet ground grew louder. It neared me, and so did the laughing. Louder and louder it ran and pounded. I grabbed the hat and sprinted back towards the ladder. Somehow, whoever was running kept pace with me, still edging closer. I slipped my phone into the pocket, placed the hat loosely upon my head, wrapped my fingers around the rungs above my head, my feet clamored for a spot on the lower portions of the ladder. The faster she ran, the louder the steps. The giggling ensued. I climbed and climbed. Out of the darkness I ascended. I thrusted my right elbow over the trapdoor's frame, onto the surrounding floorboards. And then the running stopped. She was here. The giggling no longer echoed as much as it resonated from beneath my feet. It was even more terrifying. Her small fingers grabbed at my ankles, long nails piercing my pant leg. I pressed my elbow harder into the oak floor for support against her pull. She couldn't pull too hard. She was no more than ten years old. But her nails dug so deep, her giggle broke out into a demonic laugh. I kicked violently, my legs flailing. Help, I cried out, not knowing who would hear. The long nails ripped at my skin, slipping downwards. The hand pulled harder, but I mustered the strength to hoist my torso over the opening and onto the floor. From there it was easier to kick, easier to break loose of the demonic girl. Her laughing turned to frustration, grunting. Finally, I wiggled loose and darted from the trapdoor. I ran out the front, Reed's baseball cap still bobbing on my head. I called the police and continued running running as far away as I could from that horrible house. My wet bare feet scraped against the uneven brick sidewalks, but I didn't care. The police opened a case within 15 minutes of my call, timelier than I expected. They sent a team into the house and requested I join them to point them in the right direction. I vehemently refused. I didn't want anything to do with whatever was in there. I told them about the trapdoor, about the heavy air, about the baseball cap, Reed, and the laughing girl. They took me seriously enough, or as much as I'd expect anyone to give in the story. After about ten minutes the team emerged. They all had the same look on their faces, disappointment, awkwardly sucking their lips, avoiding eye contact. The police chief approached me, the Red Sox cap I gave him still in his hands. He haphazardly offered it back to me just before beginning to speak. Lori Wright, listen, we see cases like this all the time. It's a haunted town, you know. It's not that we don't believe you, we just... Won't you at least look? I shot back, tears still welled in my eyes. 
He's my fiancé for Christ's sake. The chief nodded and his team converged around me. He continued. That's the thing. We did look, miss. We were just in there. My boys saw the rug in the living room and looked underneath just like you said. Lori, the thing is, there was no trapdoor. What? I hissed. Yes, there is, I know it, I saw it, I went down there. Reed is still down there with that little demon girl. You need to look for him, please. As the words came out of my mouth, I hardly believed it myself. I can't waste department time on conspiracy theories and ghost stories, you have to understand. I'm sorry. Another man on his team grabbed my hands and thrust my wrists together. Please, I said, crying once more. He turned away and got in the driver's seat of his car. I'm out of jail now, three months later. Reed's parents still think I did it, but they never found any evidence other than Reed's hat. No body, no more blood, no nothing. I lost my fiancé that day, and no jail sentence would have been worse. Even though I've left that prison and Savannah altogether, my life has less meaning than it used to. I'm not sure I'll ever be able to love again. I'll always think back to that trapdoor and that bloody red socks cap. I'll look over our pictures sometimes, loosely capturing all the years we had together. Since losing Reed, I've wanted nothing more than answers. The Savannah PD has tried to close the case multiple times on false conclusions, but I always call back giving them an ear full about it each time. Reed Garland is still in that house, still down there with that girl. After a while, I gathered the strength to research the house we stayed in. Poring over countless articles and accounts of the house, I finally found the answers I needed. Prior to burning down in 1831, the house was a hub for the Underground Railroad. It was responsible for hiding and transporting slaves up north to freedom. The house burned down because a group of barbaric slave owners came one day looking for their property. When they arrived, the homeowners, their daughter, and the twenty slaves all descended into their secret basement accessed through a trapdoor in the living room. The slave owners still ransacked in the house, until it was nothing more than charred, simmering wood littering the property. Charred wood littered the property in its place. None of the house's inhabitants ever escaped, and only a few unidentifiable corpses were found. Since then, the house was rebuilt. But that trapdoor, that trapdoor never was. When we arrived at the Airbnb, it seemed like the perfect getaway. A charming Victorian house on the outskirts of a sleepy town, surrounded by rolling fields and ancient oak trees. My wife, Laura, and our two kids, Ellie and Max, were excited to settle in for the weekend. The owner had mentioned a few quirks about the house, a hidden room, a strange old fireplace, but we didn't think much of it. The first night was peaceful. We spent time exploring the house, marveling at the antique furnishings and creaky floorboards. Ellie and Max were thrilled with their attic playroom, a cozy nook filled with old toys and books. Laura and I enjoyed a quiet evening by the fireplace, chatting about our plans for the weekend. It wasn't until the second day that things started to get strange. I was exploring the basement, a place we hadn't really ventured into yet. The basement door was hidden behind a heavy velvet curtain in the dining room. It creaked ominously as I opened it, revealing a narrow staircase that descended into darkness. The basement itself was dimly lit by a single, flickering bulb. The walls were lined with shelves filled with dusty jars and old, cobweb-covered furniture, at first glance, it looked like a typical, though neglected, storage area. But then I noticed something odd. A door at the far end of the basement, partially hidden behind a stack of old crates. Curiosity got the better of me, and I moved the crates aside to reveal the door. It was old and rusted, with a heavy lock that seemed out of place in the otherwise ordinary basement. I called Laura over, intrigued by this hidden feature of our rental. Laura was hesitant but her curiosity matched mine. We managed to pry open the lock, and with a groan, the door swung inward. Beyond it was, a narrow, descending staircase leading to another level of the basement. It was even darker and colder than the room above. 
We exchanged nervous glances but decided to explore further, thinking it might be part of the house's historical charm. As we descended the stairs, I noticed how much colder it became, as though the air itself had become denser. The walls here were lined with old, faded wallpaper, and the floor was covered in a layer of dust that suggested no one had been down here for a long time. The air was thick with the scent of mold and decay. The staircase ended at a heavy wooden door, which creaked loudly as we opened it. What lay beyond was disturbing. A small, dimly lit room filled with strange, unsettling artifacts. There were old, leather-bound books stacked haphazardly, strange symbols drawn on the walls, and an array of what looked like medical instruments from a bygone era. The room had an unnatural chill, and an eerie, palpable sense of dread hung in the air. Laura and I tried to make sense of it, but the feeling of unease only grew stronger. It felt as though we were intruding on something that was never meant to be disturbed. I decided to take a closer look around. On one wall, partially obscured by a large, dusty sheet, was an old-fashioned mirror. The mirror's surface was cloudy, but I could just make out the reflection of a doorway leading into another room. I pulled away the sheet, revealing a hidden door. Laura and I hesitated but felt compelled to see what was on the other side. I slowly opened the door, revealing a smaller room with a single, ancient-looking bed in the center. The bed was covered in a tattered quilt, and the room had an unsettlingly personal feel, as though it had been used recently. My heart raced. As I approached the bed, I noticed something beneath the quilt. I pulled it back to reveal a collection of old photographs scattered across the bed. The photographs were of various people, but they all had something in common. Their eyes were scratched out, their faces defaced with dark, menacing scribbles. Just then, I heard the creak of footsteps from behind me. I turned to see Ellie and Max standing at the entrance to the room. They must have followed us down into the basement. Their faces were pale, their eyes wide with fear. Dad, what's wrong with this place? Ellie asked, her voice trembling. Before I could respond, the room seemed to grow colder and the lights flickered. An unsettling whisper filled the air, as though voices were coming from within the walls. Laura grabbed the kids and urged them to leave, but as we turned to go back up the stairs, the basement door slammed shut with a deafening bang. Panic set in. I tried to force the door open, but it was locked tight. The kids were crying, and Laura was frantically trying to calm them down. We searched for another exit but the basement seemed to have no other doors or windows. Desperation set in as we tried to pry the door open. I could hear the whispers growing louder, more insistent, as though they were urging us to stay. I knew we had to escape, but the more we struggled, the more the sense of dread and terror grew. Eventually, after what felt like hours, the door finally gave way, and we stumbled back into the main basement. We grabbed the kids and fled up the stairs, not looking back. The basement door slammed shut behind us, and we didn't stop running until we were outside, gasping for air. We packed our things in a frenzy and left the house without another word. The owner was nowhere to be found, and we left without bothering to explain our hasty departure. The drive home was silent, filled with an oppressive, uneasy silence. Since that night, Ellie and Max have been distant, their once carefree spirits replaced with an anxiety I can't explain. They have nightmares almost every night, and neither Laura nor I can shake the feeling that something followed us from that house. I've tried to rationalize it, but every time I close my eyes, I see the hidden basement, the strange artifacts, and the photographs with the defaced faces. I don't know what we stumbled upon, but I know one thing for sure. Something evil was lurking beneath that Airbnb, and I fear it has followed us. To this day, I haven't seen my children truly smile or laugh since that night. We're all haunted by what we found in that basement, and though we've tried to move on, the memories remain, a dark stain on our lives that we can't erase. When I booked the Airbnb, I didn't think twice. It was supposed to be a cozy weekend getaway in a quaint little town, and the photos looked charming. 
Little did I know, I was about to step into a nightmare. The drive to the house was pleasant enough scenic views of rolling hills and fields of golden corn. The town itself was picturesque, almost straight out of a storybook. But as we pulled up to the address, my heart sank. The house, while not falling apart, was far from the rustic retreat I had imagined. It looked more like an abandoned property from a horror movie. The first hint of trouble came when I opened the front door and was hit with an overwhelming stench. It was a mixture of mildew, rotting food, and something else I couldn't quite place. I held my breath and stepped inside, hoping the smell was just an anomaly. The inside was worse than the outside. The floors were sticky, and the carpet felt like a relic from the 70s. The living room was cluttered with old newspapers and half-burned candles. The sofa, covered in what I could only describe as a thick layer of grime, seemed to have absorbed decades of neglect. I shuddered as I sat on the edge, careful not to touch anything. My friends and I exchanged uneasy glances but tried to stay optimistic. It was late, and we were too tired to drive back. We decided to make the best of it. We split up to check out our rooms. The bedroom I chose was no better. The sheets on the bed were stained with something brownish, and the pillowcases had an odd, sticky residue. The nightstand was covered in dust, and the lamp flickered sporadically, casting eerie shadows on the walls. The bathroom was the final blow. The sink was clogged with hair and soap scum, and the toilet was stained with something I hoped was just rust. The shower curtain was moldy, hanging in a way that suggested it hadn't been replaced in years. I felt a creeping sense of dread as I realized there was no way to clean or sanitize any of this effectively. Maybe we should just leave, I suggested to my friends, but they were too exhausted to care. We settled for a quick, uncomfortable sleep, trying not to think about the germs we were likely picking up. As night fell, things took a turn for the worse. I awoke to strange noises scratching sounds coming from the walls. I chalked it up to the old house settling, or perhaps an animal in the attic, but the noises grew louder and more persistent. They seemed to come from inside the walls, moving closer and closer to my bed. My skin crawled as I lay there, trying to convince myself it was just my imagination. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed through the room, and the scratching stopped. I turned on the light, my hands shaking, but the room was as it had been dark and oppressive. I dared to glance at the floor, and my heart nearly stopped. A series of small, dark stains formed a pattern that seemed to spell out something in a language I couldn't decipher. I decided I couldn't stay another minute. I quietly gathered my friends and told them we had to leave. They were groggy but agreed once they saw the look of sheer panic on my face. We grabbed our things and fled into the night. As we drove away, I glanced back at the house. It looked even more sinister in the moonlight the windows like dark, unblinking eyes watching us leave. We didn't stop until we reached the nearest hotel, where we spent the rest of the night huddled together, trying to shake off the feeling of unease. The next day, I contacted Airbnb to report the house. They assured me they would investigate and handle the situation, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something deeply wrong lurked within those walls. I never did find out what caused the disturbances or what secrets that house held. All I knew was that some places should remain unexplored, and some accommodations are better left in the past. I've never been so grateful for a clean hotel room or a good night's sleep. The horror of that Airbnb is something I carry with me, a reminder of a nightmarish encounter that made me rethink the safety and comfort I once took for granted. Whenever I stop moving, they find me. I woke up in the back of a Greyhound bus coated in sweat. Maybe it was the 115 degree Nevada sun cutting through the windows, or maybe my body was trying to warn me the bus had stopped an hour before it was supposed to. I got up as soon as I opened my eyes and tried to figure out what happened. I walked through the aisle towards the driver, parting the sea of my fellow aimless losers and failed criminals until I got to the front and saw the driver wrenching on something on the front of the bus. Cactus, some tobacco-stained voice gargled behind me. 
I turned around and saw a guy who looked like he should have been in the band Queen's rich long dyed jet black curly hair, jeans, black vest. He was safe. They'd never show up looking that lame. I climbed out of the bus and took to the scalding pavement. I started walking away from the front of the bus. I thought the last map I saw said there was a town in that direction. Ely, maybe. A. Eh? I whipped around and saw the bus driver on his hands and knees at the front of the bus trying to pry something out from underneath it. I saw way too much portly belly hair and ass crack for my liking so I went back about my business of walking up the road. I just stopped to kick something off and turns out I ran over a dog or some shit. The driver went on even though I stopped listening after his opening statement of A. His follow-up was enough to stop me in my tracks. I was fairly certain there weren't any dogs wandering around the lonely desert we were in, and the idea we had been stopped for some time before I woke up was concerning. I shot a look back to where the driver was trying to wrench the dog out and enjoyed a vantage point that allowed me to see it wasn't a dog that was stuck under the front bumper. It was a beat up, bloody, blonde girl covered in tattoos. Think Nancy Spungen, but worse. A indeed. The driver starting stammering nonsense and making apologies once he saw the young woman. I said a silent little prayer for him and watched the woman stab a butterfly knife into his stomach. I said another little prayer for myself before I started to run away, even though I didn't think I would need it. I had a good enough of a head start that she would fade out before she could catch up with me. It would take her at least a minute to cut into that poor driver's stomach and realize he wasn't who she was looking for. I knew it was futile, but I tried to puke it out one more time. No success. All I did was empty my stomach of the hostess cherry pie the sad-ass grandma on the bus had been so kind to give me after she saw how skinny I was. Didn't taste bad coming up though. At least the vomit momentarily distracted me from regretting the decision I had made in the California desert a week before. I had figured the Coachella bro I was robbing was full of shit, spilling nonsense just so I wouldn't pinch his stash. I was wrong. It was all a genius idea until it wasn't. Crash Coachella parties at Airbnbs and intimidate pussy rich kids into giving me their stashes and then selling their primo drugs and keeping what I wanted for myself. I was a rough 38 year old who looked like a former biker drug runner that could have been an extra in Sons of Anarchy because that's exactly what I was, well, except for the former part. My only mistake was taking one of the round little orange balls the kid I robbing warned me not to take. He didn't say exactly what the orange mushroom thing I took down would do, but I have gleaned a few things about it since the moment I swallowed it in a motel room in Palm Desert. It had sicked a bunch of brain-dead, supernatural, tattooed hipster punks after me who relentlessly pursued me and killed anyone who got in their way and then searched their stomach, looking for that orange mushroom I assume. Said undead hipster punks would only appear when I stopped moving whether by foot or by vehicle, and they showed up as soon as I did. There was no sign of when this was going to stop. I had tried to vomit up the orange mushroom ten times, and had yet to see it come out, from either end for that matter. Those aforementioned punks made quick work of the only woman I had ever loved. I checked in with my mom in Riverside as soon as the drugs kicked in, and it seemed like the world was speeding around me at 100 miles per hour. I was horrified to find her staying at a $55 a night vagabond inn by the freeway, chain smoking, and trying to act like the gentleman callers who could knock on the room were just stumbling upon the wrong room. She took a night off for me and let her permanent F up only son crash on the spare bed in her room until he slept off the nightmare drug. Remember the thing where you were a kid where you would get the other kid to sleep closer to the door, so if a monster or killer, or both, came in they would get them first. Well that albeit unintentional situation cost my mother her life and saved mine. I woke in the middle of the night relatively sober and listening to the sound of my dear mother gasping for air. I looked over and saw some pale, skinny, rat of a man finishing choking her on the other full-sized bed in the room. I watched for a moment as he then whipped out a switchblade and aimed it at her stomach. The man disappeared by the time I jumped off of my bed and onto him. So did my mom. 
I checked her vitals. She was gone. I called the proper authorities, did my best to appear sober. They ruled the death an overdose. I didn't argue. She was dead. Who cares now? I moved on and by moved on, I mean checked into the room next to the one where my mom died and tried to get some more sleep. Spoiler. I didn't. I woke up in what must have been five minutes after I fell asleep to see another punk breaking down the door. I jumped up out of bed and made a mad dash for the door. The grungy punk clawed the shit out of me on my way out, but I was free. I ran up and down the nasty streets of Riverside until I reached the edge of town and ran out into the desert. I was about 100 yards into pure sand when I stopped to pick some sharp brush out of my sock and saw the punk again. Well, not the same one, this one was different shaved head, no tattoos, possibly straight edge, but the same dead look in his eyes. For all of you picturing a slow, dumb walker from The Walking Dead right now lumbering at me looking like the lead singer from Minor Threat, forget about it. This guy was dead ringer for Ian Mackay, but he moved like Lawrence Taylor on an end rush or Michael Strahan, if you don't know shit about football. I started running again. I turned around after a while with a lot more sharp brush in my shoe. He was gone. I stopped. A friend of him appeared. A friend as in a girl who looked a lot like him with the same level of pursuit. That's when I realized the first rule of what was going on. If I stopped, they would find me. I walked as long as I could, until I ran a couple of marathons and couldn't move anymore. Then I decided to test out if general motion was all I needed to keep them at bay. I bought the longest Greyhound bus ticket I could afford out to the Nevada desert. I figured a flat, unpopulated setting without buildings or trees would give me the best chance at spotting any of the relentless thinged once they came onto my horizon if I had to endure another attack. It worked. I avoided the punks as long as the bus was moving. I always took the first seat I could find and ran off the thing as fast as I could when it stopped. This worked until a week in when I had to transfer and take a seat near the back and the bus stopped unexpectedly. I had stopped. They had found me and I was caught off guard. Let's get back to it. Something had changed this time. Maybe the drug had kicked in harder. Maybe the punks had officially banned together. Maybe I was just a cursed dipshit destined to have a life that was wholly forgettable other than for me being epically selfish get wiped off the earth at the age of 38. No matter the reason, there was now about 20 of the hostile punks circling around me in the endless desert as the sun started to dip down under the cover of the Sierra Nevada mountains to the west. The punks were about 20 yards away from me on all sides. They had me and a lone cactus cornered in the sand just as darkness was falling. I, I tried running circles as fast as I could as a last ditch effort to lose them, but nothing. They just kept running at me and were on me within 10 seconds. It was time to fight. I felt the bastards swiping at my neck, my eyes, a jagged nailed finger got stuck in my ear, even my genitals weren't off limits. I felt a couple blades start cutting through my pants around my manhood. These guys fought without rules. So did I. More than a few nights in jail when I had to fight for respect and a few of mom's boyfriends who fancied themselves brawlers that weren't afraid to take on kids had made me more than capable of fending for myself, even against what seemed like an entire football team of rabid black flag fans. I took a few out with hard throat punches, an old, trusty friend of mine. Some eye gouges helped get some more off my back, then a sweep of the leg knocked down enough so I could make a run away from all of them, back towards the road, just as the only light that was left was that of the fresh stars and moon, and I had lost about half a pint of blood. My adversaries were out of sight, or at least just lost in the dark when I reached the road and I saw headlights. 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 I literally laughed like a maniac when I saw them coming. I employed a trick that one of murderous friends apparently had used to stop my bus. I laid down across the road and waited for the vehicle to approach and either stop to help or run me over not a bad outcome at this point. Lying there was sweet relief. I had been on the run for days at this point, 
racking up hundreds of miles on my feet with almost no sleep. I saw that the vehicle was a piece of shit mid-2000 Chevy sedan when it approached. It stopped about two feet from my skull. I let out the deepest breath I had in quite some time when I heard the boots of the driver make their way toward me. Good, I thought you were dead. I heard the oddly high-pitched voice of the driver announce on his way up to me. I was blinded by the headlights, and it was dark so I didn't get a very good look at the driver until I was in the passenger seat, and we were going 85 down the highway, and I gave him a once-over. My nearly dead heart stopped when I looked over and saw a shaved head, skinny white guy covered in black tattoos behind the wheel, and realized it was a scratched-up Bad Brain CD playing on the car stereo. I grabbed the handle of the door. Would I die upon impact if I jumped out going almost 90? I surely would. I convinced myself that the guy's looks and musical preference was simply a horrifying coincidence and closed my eyes. I said one more thing before I drifted off to sleep. Just wake me up before you stop if you're going to. Good deal, my driver answered. Don't worry, they'll find me if I stop moving too. So my neighbors are really, really odd. Married couple, with five kids ranging from 613. They are Mormon, we think, which isn't anything stranger than social awkwardness occasionally since they don't drink, and I have never seen them eat food at neighborhood gatherings either, come to think of it. Their children are very different. They are all super afraid of dogs, not too weird. But I mean my dog is a fluffy lick machine weighing 20 pounds soaking wet, and they are crazy scared of him. The littlest one is quite possibly the shyest little girl I have ever even heard of. It's very difficult to get her to speak even, but I suppose that happens too so not the strangest thing. Here's what strikes me as odd, they are almost never, ever outside. Our neighborhood is small but full of kids, playing outside in the cul-de-sac almost every day. Those kids maybe step outside for activity other than transportation to another building once, maybe twice a year. Exceptionally pale. That strikes me as the most odd how within five kids of various ages is one of them not outdoorsy. Now, there is an exception to this. The littlest shy girl will come play with my little girl five if asked, sometimes. She gets escorted over by a sibling or parent. She's so pale she's almost translucent and rarely ever even talks to my little girl while they play. When it's time for her to go home, a sibling will sneak up on me every damn time and startle me to say they've come to collect her. It's pretty much the only reason any of her siblings leave the house on foot to walk over, get the littlest one, and escort her back home. The home literally right next to our home, with zero through traffic. As a side note, I have stepped inside their house once, and there is virtually no furniture inside. There is a couch in the living room, and two identical old area rugs. It's not a small house like three, five hundred square feet, so the lack of other furniture is very noticeable. What are the kids doing in a house with no furniture 364 days a year? I digress. The parents are outside often, though the husband refuses to let his wife do any labor-type work. He'll pull a 12-hour day while she stays home, and then he'll mow the lawn when he gets home, in long sleeve shirts and pants, in the dead of summer. For the longest time we didn't know what he did for a living. When asked he'd just say, I'm not in the military, and then not elaborate any further. Like, WTF? Later we learned he works in the sanitation product industry, but no more detail. Okay, so there's the setup. Here's where it gets weird as F. One day he shows up with a giant refrigerated truck that won't fit in his driveway. He parks it in the street and leaves it running. All. Day. It's not very quiet I could hear the thing idling from inside my kitchen. Fast forward to 1 a.m., and as I am snagging a glass of water I see movement out on the street. We live on a cul-de-sac, so it caught my eye. I look out the window and the whole family is putting black trash bags full of stuff into the refrigerated truck from the house. 1 a.m. And even the little shy six-year-old is helping to schlep bags smaller ones. As I stare at the scene I am dumbfounded trying to rationalize what is occurring. I just still can't figure it out. They go at this for quite some time, close up the truck, and leave it running all night. Daytime comes and I head in to work around 7, truck still there, still idling. A neighbor later said they saw the husband drive it away about 30 minutes after 7. Fast forward over a year later, and they do it again. Well, the truck was back, but I didn't stay up to see if they did the bags again, 
I can only assume they did because why else get the same truck? It reminds me of the movie The Burbs, but creepier because there's no comedy involved, just real creepy vibes. I'm actually a bit nervous they'll maybe one day find this super specific post that is so obviously about them, so I'll probably take it down after a week or two. I just needed to tell somebody about how freaking weird this whole thing seems to me. So back in my early 20s I moved into my first apartment. I quickly got a roommate and my naive ass was so excited to finally be starting in on adult life. Now there were all sorts of sketchy things going on in that apartment building, from the friendly drug dealer across the hall, the frequently reported domestic violence situation going on upstairs, the fist fights in the parking lot, and various other things going on, but the one that I will always remember was the creepy neighbor down the hall. How this particular building was set up was all the apartments formed a square around and above the parking garage that was on the lower level. In the center of the garage were the dumpsters so everyone could just throw their trash down from the balcony outside. It should also be noted that everyone's kitchen windows faced out into the middle, so they were right along the walkway. On more than one occasion, creepy neighbor would lean out his kitchen window and watch my roommate and I as we were leaving. We had to walk right past him to get to the stairs, and he would ask where we were going, give us creepy compliments, and sometimes came up with excuses to invite us into his apartment, like saying he ordered too much pizza, or he had some furniture he wanted to sell that we should come look at. Sometimes he would just stare intensely and make you want to run past him before he could open his door or drag you through the window. He also spent a lot of time every day rummaging through the dumpsters. Now, I have nothing against dumpster diving. Sometimes you do what you need to survive, but doing it in broad daylight in front of all your neighbors whose trash is in said dumpster is just super creepy. Eventually he was evicted, but he refused to leave. He left a barely legible, all caps, handwritten note on his door, saying the landlords did not have permission to enter his apartment and hid whenever they came around. I remember seeing him dash to his door, grabbing one of the many notices they had left before dashing away again to wherever he spent his days. I still don't know how they finally got him out, but I'm pretty sure he continued to search through the dumpsters after that. I got out of there as soon as my lease ended. I hope he got the help he obviously needed, but I will never forget how scary that guy was to live near. My neighbor isn't creepy. Just odd. He's an old guy that's retired so he spends most of his days drunk and being a hermit. He divorced a long time ago and none of his kids or family live in the state. The neighbor across the street told me this story. He said during Christmas time he was struggling to get his Christmas tree into the house, but bought too big a tree. He said he sees our drunk neighbor coming across the street thinking he's going to help bring it in. Nope. He stood in the driveway for 15 minutes asking him questions about his wife. She's from Malaysia. He asked if he got her from a service or catalog. My neighbor with the tree said no and told them how they met it was in college in the US. My neighbor said he finally got the tree inside and thought maybe that was the end of this weird or rude conversation. Nope. The drunk neighbor followed him inside and started asking if maybe she had any lady friends back home that were looking for husbands. He went on to say that he wants her to be young skinny, be good with housework, and have big boobs. All the while, the neighbor with the tree's seven-year-old daughter is standing behind drunk neighbor listening to all of this. Drunk neighbor turns around and asks if that's his wife. He finally got kicked out after that remark. Next day, drunk neighbor flags down the family and apologize for his words. The daughter and dad said it was super awkward. They try to avoid him now. The first apartment my husband, now ex, and I lived in had a super creepy manager. I was eight months pregnant when we moved in, and he wanted to touch my belly all the time. I would jerk away from him because it creeped me out, and I guess he caught on because he said, Sorry pregnant women just make me salivate. Dude. What the F? Then right after I had my kid, I seen him in the courtyard area of the apartment, and he says, You still haven't had the baby? I reply, Yeah, like two days ago. I was still hella swollen everywhere cause I had just popped out a 9 pound kid. He says, Oh you now you need to lose that baby weight. The doctor should give you water pills. I just turned around and left the douchebag standing there. He would never say these random things when my husband was around. It got to where I would avoid going out if I seen him outside. 
Towards the end of our stay at those apartments, we had a suspicion he was coming in our house. Things would be misplaced or moved, and once we had pie in the fridge that totally disappeared. When we moved, he wanted our new address to send the deposits, and he started showing up there under the guise of being a Jehovah's Witness. My husband flipped and told him if he ever saw him around our house again, he'd kill him. I still see him around town, and I just pretend I don't know him. A few months ago, I was sitting on my front porch enjoying a peaceful afternoon. I live out in the country, my closest neighbors being over a mile away. Just me and my dog watching squirrels run across the dirt road. About mid-afternoon, a fellow stops out by the road and asks to enter my yard. I wave him in. Seems like a decent enough guy. As he approached the steps, my dog moved to block him. The dog was growling lowly and his hair was standing on his back. This was unusual. The man asked if he would bite. I replied, he's meaner than hell. He isn't mean and has never bitten anyone. But this guy doesn't need to know that. So he stands in the yard and introduces himself as the son of a neighbor down the road apiece. He has moved back home to be with his mom, who is getting up in age. We make pleasant small talk back and forth. My dog stays between us. He doesn't take his eyes off of this stranger. He isn't growling, but the hair on his back is still standing. This puts me on edge as well. I bid the fellow good day and walk into the house. After watching him drive away, I do a search of the name he gave me. It doesn't take long to find out he is a registered S offender. I felt shivers down my spine. Being that I have a wife and teenage daughter, I felt it necessary to call the man's mother. I told her to inform him not to be around my place anymore. I have always heard a dog can spot bad in a person. I believe it now. Good boy. I once had a neighbor who seemed like he hated everyone. Me and my brother would go outside and pass the young football around, and he would just glare at us from his window if the ball were to accidentally roll into his yard. He would come out screaming absolutely livid that we would let that happen. That's the only interaction he would have with anyone. One day he just disappeared left all of his stuff behind never to be heard from again. At this point me and my friends are teenagers, so the only logical thing to do is break into this guy's abandoned house and see what all he left. Mostly normal stuff, clothes, furniture, that sort of stuff. But in the closet there was a small jar filled with teeth and locked under the house in the crawl space was a box full of random knives. He was a weird dude and possibly a murderer. I was dating this woman and we decided to move in together. We were going to sublease the apartment from this guy. He was really creepy. During the winter, her apartment would get really cold and he would tell her that she could come up to his apartment. This stopped when I started staying the night more often. During the summer, she would be sitting outside, and he always came down to talk to her. Until I showed up, then he'd take off. Growing up, there was a neighbor kid who I think was a few years older than me, but we always played and stuff. One day when I was eight, I went to the shed to feed my bunny, and he followed me in. He blocked my path to my rabbit, and I asked him to move. He refused to unless I kissed him or unbuttoned my shirt. Me being a stupid child was like you uh, it's gross to kiss boys, so I unbuttoned my shirt. I can't remember if he said anything else, but he left soon after, and I told my parents who then yelled at me for doing something so stupid against my will. This incident occurred when I 20 female was 17. I was walking home from a party, and it was pretty late, around 4.35 a.m. One of my guy friends decided to walk me home since he didn't want me to walk alone so late. The streets were empty, and it was pitch black. As we were walking and chatting, we noticed that a man was approaching us. When he reached us, he started saying over and over again, Hey, I'm a good guy, I promise. He didn't seem threatening, and I remember that I didn't feel scared, perhaps because I was with my friend, who is an athletic person. So, this guy starts asking us for money to buy a sandwich and tells us that he can't return home until 10 a.m. because his neighbor has a restraining order against him apparently. The neighbor leaves for work at that hour. At that point, we were like, what is going on? We decided to give him some money so he would leave us alone. We gave him around 5 euros, which is more than enough to buy a sandwich, and then lied, telling him that's all we had. 
Then this man looks at me and says, No, that's not true. You have more money in your wallet. I can see it from here. At that point, I just put my wallet back into my purse and told him I couldn't give him more money. As we were walking away from this man, he once again caught up to us and said, Why don't you guys come with me to try and find a vending machine? That way, you can make sure I'm not spending your money on drugs. I don't exactly remember what we told him, but there was no way we were going with him anywhere. Even though I didn't feel scared or threatened at the moment, in hindsight, it was kinda creepy, and I'm just glad my friend insisted on walking me home. Was he just desperate for money, or did he have other intentions? P.S. English is not my first language, so I'm sorry if I made any mistakes. This morning my husband went to take out the trash, and when he came back he said some kids were staring into our yard. I thought it was weird but eventually forgot about it until I went outside to go up to my upstairs neighbor's house. This 16-18 year old boy was literally standing on something and looking over the fence. I got really freaked out but just went upstairs and knocked on my neighbor's door. She didn't answer, and when I turned around I saw him just standing there staring at me through the window. I kind of froze and just stared right back, and after about a minute he sat down. Now every time I look out the window, he's at the fence just staring into our backyard. It's been hours. I'm not sure if I'm overreacting, but it's just so odd. Back when I was five, these new neighbors moved next door. Regular family, two kids. The kids were about ten and their bedroom window was opposite the window of my dad's office. So when they played the Spice Girls wannabe, he was infuriated. But I digress. The father would yell, scream, and just be a dick in general, leading my parents to just say, stay away from that place. I never saw the rest of the family, but I heard them yell. Their house fell into a horrid state, run down, overgrown, etc. It looked like the set of a horror movie. Anyway, one day I'm about seven, and this lady knocks on the door. Hi, just thought you should know, the house next door is on fire. We freaked and ran outside. News cameras, fire engines, people everywhere. My dad managed to go into the backyard and help out somewhat. Turns out that the guy had set up a gas canister to blow up, then he set the house on fire. His wife and kids had left, so he wanted to kill himself. Only thing is, after the fire burned through him, it sort of petered out. So he was there just trying to soothe his burns since he wasn't going to die. My dad told me that the sight of him just pouring water from a hose onto his charred legs was awful, with burns all over the rest of his body, fighting to stay alive. The guy went to hospital and died about a week later. We live in a very decent area with low crime and all of that other good shit. We have had several folks come and go next to our house. Each has been very strange in their own ways. The folks who were already living in that house when we moved in were a couple of rednecks. I come from humble origins, so that doesn't qualify them as less. Our favorite quote from them was, If you can't respect a pool tournament, then how can you respect me? They also went on to lose their electricity, so they had to power everything by a generator. That meant that during the summer all of the gas fumes and smoke would blow directly into our windows. Everyone within four houses complained, and eventually the city came out to fix things. They had a team of folks in hazmat suits go into the house and clean lots of horrible things, huge amounts of garbage, pet waste, no longer living pets, etc. The house was vacant for months until the single weird dude moved in. We don't like to smoke in the house, so we do it on the back porch. And for several months, this guy was bumming smokes three, four times a week. He would come up to the fence between our yards and bum one. I don't mind folks bumming smokes occasionally, but it got to the point where I dreaded seeing him dread is probably a bit more dramatic than it was. One day I finally told the guy that he needed to start buying his own smokes, I did give him one right then as well. We didn't see him again. Two weeks later my wife tells me there are several police cars in front of his house. I go out to the backyard and see at least four cops. They eventually came around to the front of our house and asked if we had seen anything weird. I was like shit. I told him to buy his own smokes a week ago. That was funny, but in no way useful to the police. A week later, there is a worker who is cleaning and painting that house, so I ask him what happened. Turned out the guy had been dead in his closet for several days. They found his body beaten black and blue and hanging in a closet. That was the end of that guy. 
Sorry, this is getting long and probably boring. There are two more neighbors. The next person to move in was a college girl. We live a mile away from a huge university. The first odd part about her was that I could hear her talking to her mother on the phone a few weeks after she moved in. She just kept crying about all of the bugs that were in the house. This happened for days. I felt bad for her and wanted to warn her of the house's odd history. The other funny and not creepy thing about her was her sexy times. She was a young white chick who was banging a young black dude. They would make sweet love with the window open 15 feet from our porch. She quite vocally encouraged him to have coitus with her and his rather impressive brown member. I don't know if I have to mark this NSFW so I am self-censoring. That was it for her. She still had to be mentioned for the bugs and the sexy times. They moved out and a mentally slow person moved in. He was I assume and hope harmless minus the very weird sounds of construction that would come from his house from 10 p.m. 3 a.m. His parents would come in several times a week and clean the place and bring him food. One day in broad daylight a car pulled over and shot him four times. He somehow lived and his parents moved him away. I don't live in a neighborhood where people get shot on the street. We are renters, but if our house went up for sale, it would be 150k at least and sell in a day or two our house is not worth that much, but we live in an attractive neighborhood. Most of the nicer places are going for 250k plus. New neighbors have been living in the place for about six months, and I have zero desire to learn anything about them. This has to sound like horseshit, and I totally understand. If anything, I have played the weirdness down a lot. There is something odd about that house. A couple of weeks ago, someone dropped groceries at my door along with two coffees. The groceries were very odd. They had lubricant, lollipops, not your normal grocery shop. I thought it was delivered to the wrong apartment, and as there was no receipt or confirmation in the bag, I left it in the lobby. However, no one claimed it. A week later, a letter was slipped under my door with $200 S in it. The letter was from a man talking about his recent hardships and expressing a desire to talk to me and hear my voice. Again, being a little naive, I took the note to my building manager, thinking it was meant for someone else. He found it strange, so he called the number on the letter. It turned out to be a man in the building next door, stating that he wants to be my friend the buildings are really close together, and you can see into the apartments if the blinds are open. My building manager told him to leave me alone and stay out of the building. I thought it was over, but today I heard someone pacing in the hallway outside my apartment for a couple of minutes. When I went to leave an hour later, I found a coin in front of my door dead center, as if it had been deliberately placed there. The only way it could get there would be if it was intentionally placed, or if my neighbor dropped it, as my neighbor should be the only other person that walks past my door. Normally, I wouldn't think twice about the coin, but given what has been happening, it's making me really anxious. Update. Two days after the coin incident, I left my apartment, and a man in his 60s or 70s approached me straight away, telling me he's selling his car and asking if I want to take a look at it. I have the number plate information and am reporting it to the police. Just got a knock on the door from my neighbor saying that there was an all black SUV pointing a phone towards my house while sitting under the shady spot of the street. My neighbor saw him, the guy who delivers the water saw him, and the my mom's boyfriend who came home saw him drive off when he arrived. I will update if anything else happens within the next week. My neighbor is now checking their home security footage, trying to find out just who the hell it is. When I was in grad school, I moved from my home state to a new state that was five hours away from my classes. However, the area around the university wasn't very safe, so I thought it would be a good idea to find an apartment nearby to save money. The place I moved to was like a big house that had been changed into a three-story building with a big two-story part added to the back. I stayed in one of the middle apartments on the first floor and had a parking spot at the back of the building. I usually kept to myself, but I eventually met the people who lived in the apartment next to mine. They were a married couple without children, probably around 10 or 12 years older than me. I learned from the building manager that the husband was the son of the man who owned the whole place. Unfortunately, the husband had been in a serious car crash and had some long-lasting problems with thinking and understanding things. The wife was friendly, but had a strong and talkative personality. They both seemed very eager to meet me and get to know me, 
which I thought was because they felt lonely at first. Later on, I started to think they might want some kind of special connection with me, and it gave off a strange feeling. They often sat outside their door or left their screen door partially closed so they could see me as I walked to and from my apartment to my car. Our chats could last anywhere from five minutes to half an hour before they realized I wanted to go on with my day. Every time, they would invite me to their place for dinner and a drink, which I would kindly turn down. What made it weirder was that even though they seemed friendly to me, I could hear them shouting at each other most nights. Sometimes it went on all night while I tried to sleep. I had to put up with this for a whole year. Just before my lease was ending in January, I found a new place to live. I got pretty good at avoiding them, but when I was moving out, the husband finally caught me while I was carrying boxes. He called out, Hey, where are you going? I turned to face him but kept walking backward and said, Oh hi, I'm actually moving out this week. His eyes got really big and he just looked at me. Then he said, But you never came over for dinner. I didn't really know what to say except, Yeah, I'm sorry we never got the chance. He stood in the middle of the driveway and just kept staring at me without saying anything. So I turned around and put the box in my car. When I left the apartment complex with that stuff, I drove by him, and he just kept looking at me with wide eyes and no expression. About two days later, I had moved all the extra things out and was only living in the apartment with my essential stuff. One night, it was incredibly cold, with temperatures going below zero. When the sun went down, all the electricity in my apartment went off. I couldn't get to my electric panel, and when I called the person in charge of the building, they didn't answer. So, I had to call the electric company to tell them about the power outage and gathered my things to go stay at my girlfriend's parents' house at that time. The next morning, I went back determined to move the last of my stuff when I saw the electric company's truck parked in front of the building. I went into my apartment and a worker came up to me and asked if I was the one who told them about the power problem. I said I was and he laughed a little. Then he said, Well buddy, you managed to make someone angry. So, I asked him what he meant, and he explained, The only power issue in the building was in your apartment. Usually, when there's a problem, the switch is in the middle position. But your switch was turned all the way off, which means someone intentionally turned it off. The switch is in the basement storage area, but only the building manager or owner can get in there. I figured out that my neighbor had intentionally turned off my electricity on the coldest night of the year. I didn't bother talking to him about it. I just wanted to leave that place. I packed my things and left, not even checking if he or his wife were watching me go. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.